Hello and welcome to this latest video in the OCR GCSE Computer Science series. Within this video we're going to be undertaking a walking talking mock of the Unit 1 Computer Systems exam paper from November 2021. So this is the official paper that students in November will have sat and it's the very last paper under the old specification. For Unit 1 there's not a huge change so if you're sitting this exam from the summer of 2022 onwards you'll be on the new specification. There's not a huge amount that is different um, but I'm going to outline exactly what has changed on the next slide. It would be really useful if you had a blank copy of the paper printed off um, and you can go through and attempt that before using this video to check your answers for each section. What I will try and do is provide you with model answers for every section to show you how you can achieve a grade 9 in this paper by getting 80 out of 80. So this is the layout of the Unit 1 content under the new specification. As I say, there are some small changes uh, between the old specification and the new spec, um, but these are the topics that you'll be expected to understand. You can pause the, slide, uh, pause the video at this point and rate your understanding of each section if you think that would be useful. So we'll get started now. As I say, you're going to want a blank copy of the paper uh, to attempt each question. So I'll show the questions blank and then I'll talk you through each, uh, each answer. If you haven't got a copy of the paper, don't panic. Just pause the video on the blank version of each question, attempt it and then go through the answers. So the paper starts off with a nice fill in the blank question. Uh, it gives us a number of statements and we need to fill in the blanks using those. The important point here is that each blank should only have one statement in it. Uh, when I've marked this paper before, students think they need to fit all of the statements in, so put two or three statements per gap. You certainly don't need to do that, uh, so you're going to want to have a think around uh, what, what's going to fit in each gap. So ROM stands for read-only memory. It stores the startup instructions and cannot be changed, hence the read-only name. RAN, RAM stands for Random Access Memory. That stores the instructions and data that are currently being used. If the computer doesn't have enough RAM, it uses virtual memory. RAM and ROM are both examples of primary memory or primary storage. Memory located close to the processor that allow, allows faster access to the RAM is called cache memory. So these are all linked to that sort of memory and storage topic, which we call 1.2. You're then asked to state the purpose of the CPU. This is a really simple question if you know it, and if you don't, you're probably not going to get the marks. It's to undertake the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. Whenever you're asked about the purpose of the CPU, that is the answer. It's to undertake the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. And you need to be pretty spot on with what you're writing there for that answer. We're then asked to explain what is meant by a single core 2.5 GHz processor. The important point here is that this question is two marks, so I need to be making two very different points within my answer. So I want to explain what does the single core bit mean, and then what does the 2.5 GHz bit mean. Single core means there's only one processor working at a time. 2.5 GHz means there are 2.5 billion fetch to code execute cycles undertaken every second. The final question asks us to name two registers and we've got a number of different answers we could give there. I've gone for the memory address register and the memory data register. You've got others there though, the program counter, the current instruction registers um, and some others, the accumulator for example, um, and you can think about which one you're going to go with there. For me, the MAR and the MDR are nice ones that are easy to remember. Question two talks about Layla who uses her computer to create educational games. She makes use of system software. We're asked then to talk about two and describe two functions of an operating system. So two features, two things that an operating system uh, allows us to do. So I've got for file management and that's the creation, editing and naming of files which can be placed into folders. I need to get three marks. File management is one mark. Creation, editing and naming of files is another and then something about folders being my final mark there. I'm then looking for my second function and within that I'm going to be looking at user interface. 
that allows users to navigate the computer with a mouse using menus and icons. It also provides a graphical output so that when you click something, you see it appear on your screen. We're then asked about utility software and we're asked to state the purpose of utility software for a computer. Utility software performs maintenance tasks to keep the computer running well or running as it should. Finally, we're asked about backup and we're asked really about the difference between a full and an incremental backup, but particularly why she would need both. So, a full backup takes a copy of everything on the computer. An incremental backup takes a copy of only the files that have changed since the last backup. A full backup is therefore needed, followed by an incremental backup because the, the full backup takes all of the files and the incremental backups then take the changes. An incremental backup wouldn't work without a full backup having been taken first. We're continuing along the uh, Lila questioning now and we're asked for a benefit and a drawback of open source software. So open source is where you give your code away and you allow people to make changes to that code. The benefit of that is that other people can help you to improve your code and improve the game. The drawback is she can't really charge a fee because she's given the code out, so she can't really then ask people to pay for it to make any money. Question three is then sort of linked into that idea of those essay style questions that look at ethics and morals and an environment and culture. Um, and it's asking it in a slightly different way. It's asking you to describe the environmental impact of a technology company bringing out updated phones twice a year. So we're thinking about Apple and a new iPhone coming out every year. What are the environmental impacts? <clears throat> Again, we're looking for two marks here. So I've said old devices might be thrown out, that's one mark, and that might increase both landfill and pollution for a second mark. We're then asked about the cultural impact of that, and I've said that more second-hand devices could be available and that those might be more affordable for some people. Um, so some people might find a second-hand iPhone a lot more affordable than a brand new iPhone. That leads us on then to our essay question. Your paper will always have an eight or a nine mark essay question where you're asked to discuss a number of bullet points. So I've got eight marks and it's told me three bullet points. I must therefore discuss two or three ethical issues, two or three legal issues, two or three privacy issues, making sure that in total I make eight different points. You're always gonna wanna um, section your essay up into the paragraphs given by the bullet points, ethics, legal, privacy. And you'll see in my answer, I've made it very clear. One ethical concern is, one legal issue is, in terms of privacy, so that it's very clear to the person marking the paper that I've considered all three issues. I'm talking about positives and negatives, if I'm able. Now, I'm not gonna read through my entire answer, but I strongly suggest you pause the video at this point, have a read through, and then compare that to your style of essay answer. You do want to be thinking about your quality of written communication within this one. So is your spag uh, decent? Is your spelling, grammar and punctuation in place? We're then looking at a OCR reference language, language question or a pseudocode question and we've got some fill in the blanks. So the program is being created to convert data capacity uh, of a storage device into different measures. The function takes the measurement, e.g. gigabytes, and the number, e.g. two, and then it should return the value uh, in bits. The function returns minus one if the um, measurement is invalid. So we've been given all the hard bits, we've been given all the maths, and it's just about can you recognize which is going to be a gigabyte, what's gonna come next, and what's gonna come after that. So, we're told that into our function we need to take measurement and number. So I've added measurement in the gap. We're given then the, the calculation for gigabytes and we need to work out well, what are the remaining two calculations working out and it's megabytes and then kilobytes. We want to convert our uh, number from bytes into, into the bits that it's asked for. So we're going to times by eight. And right at the bottom then, we're returning minus one if it's invalid, e.g. if it's not gigabytes, megabytes, kilobytes, or bytes. 
and then returning value right at the end. And value is what we've calculated previously within this pseudocode. Charlie has purchased a new tablet computer. The tablet has a secondary storage device internally. Describe what is meant by an internal storage device uh, and describe what it will store. So, so we're going to be storing software and we're going to store user files. You could have the operating system as well within that answer. We're then asked about a solid state device, a solid state drive, and we're asked to give three benefits over a magnetic device. It's faster, and it says in the mark scheme you need to be quite specific about faster read and write speeds. It's pretty much silent because there are no moving parts, and they're usually smaller, so a pen drive, a USB stick, would be an example of a solid-state device. We're then asked to give two drawbacks of the tablet having a solid-state device, uh, and we're thinking about it probably being more expensive, so they're often more expensive, and they've usually got a slightly smaller capacity than a magnetic drive, although that is changing all of the time. That would allow you to get full marks within that page. Question seven then talks about a university that has a building in two sites that are five miles apart. It asks us to describe the difference between a LAN and a WAN. So a LAN is over a small geographical area while a WAN is over a large geographical area. The important point there is that you talk about this in terms of geographical areas. You can't just say a LAN is over a large area. You're given that because that's what it stands for. That's not really you describing the difference. We're then given a bit of an awkward question. Site A has four classrooms, site B has two classrooms. The network on each site between the classrooms is a star topology using a switch. The two sites are then connected over the internet. Complete the network diagram for site A of the university. Now this is an odd question because they've, they've talked about site A and B, they've talked about them being linked, but all I actually want you to do is draw site A. So, so you need a switch in the middle and you need everything else connected to the switch. You could then have the switch connected to the router as well, uh, but you don't actually need that for the two marks on offer. You need a switch in the middle for one mark and every other device connected to the switch as the second mark. So a slightly oddly worded question there that's really simple once you get around the way it's been asked, but has been asked in a slightly odd way. Site B then has higher network performance than site A. Explain how the following can contribute to network performance. So we're given four statements and we're asked to just write something about them. Now it's only four marks, so we don't need to write a lot. We just need to make one point. Wi-Fi frequency, interference, number of concurrent users and type of network traffic. Frequency, well, five gigahertz Wi-Fi can transfer data faster, normally over a smaller distance, but faster. Uh, interference, more packets need to be requested again if there's lots of interference and that reduces performance. The more users there are, the more the bandwidth is split, reducing performance. And the type of network traffic, well, videos, for example, take up a lot more bandwidth than, say, accessing a Microsoft Word document. So those, those would, again, reduce performance if everyone on the network was watching Netflix, for example. We're then asked to identify something else that uh, contributes to performance. And the, the uh, straightforward answer there is bandwidth, because we've already spoke about bandwidth in the earlier uh, question, uh, but bandwidth hasn't actually been given to us. We're then asked to describe how packet switching can be used when sending data from one site to another. And we need to make four definitive marks. When I get questions like this, I like to bullet point the answer to show that I'm clearly making four very distinct points. While the data is split into packets, each packet is sent separately. Pack each packet takes its own or different route to the destination. And then on arrival, they're put back into order to recreate the data that was sent. I really would encourage bullet points uh, on those sorts of questions. Never on the essay question, but absolutely on other questions where you've maybe got to make four, six, three uh, different points. Uh, and you want to be really clear to the examiner that you've definitely made those as separate and different points. The university then wants to protect against threats when connecting to the internet. 
describe the threat uh, that can be posed and give a prevention method that the university can use. So we're thinking about a threat from the internet and how we can prevent. Well, malware could steal data or delete data that is needed, needed and the prevention is antivirus. Got to be really clear there that it's three marks. I've got to make two different points within my description section and then give my prevention, which should be easy, as antivirus. We're then asked to describe the threat a brute force attack could pose on the university's network and give a prevention method. Um, so we're thinking about, right, what is a brute force attack? What issues could that cause? And then how could we stop it? Well, a brute force attack is all about trying to guess a password. So we could guess a password leading to private data being accessed or leaked. How can we stop that? Well, a firewall can pick up on malicious requests and block those when we're maybe getting lots of requests from the same IP address. So we could guess the password, we could leak the private data, and we'd stop that with a firewall. We've then got a networking and protocols question, and it's asking for each of these protocols, which thing does it do? Is it email? Is it transferring files? Or is it accessing websites? Well, POP and SMTP are both about email. FTP is about transferring files. And HTTPS is all about accessing web pages. One mark for each row. You can only give one, uh, one mark if you've got one tick. If you've ticked two items within one row, then you're not getting any marks for that row. We're then on to the final page, and we've got a final seven marks available across uh, part F and then question eight. The building is considered the implementation of a virtual network. Describe what is meant by a virtual network. Well, a virtual network is a software-based network which can be used to split up one physical network. So your school probably has one large physical network and that might be broken then down into a student virtual network and a staff virtual network and then maybe others like CCTV uh, and phone networks uh, within, a, within a larger school. So two marks, software-based network and then one that can be used to split up a physical network. Incidentally, they can also be used to join more than one physical network so that it looks like one network rather than many. Question eight is again a slightly oddly phrased question. It's all about legislation. They're giving us a number of statements and then we need to name the law that helps with the thing they are saying. So a programmer wants to protect their work from being copied. They want to uh, you know, maybe uh, sue someone who's accessed it without permission. What would the law be? So the first one would be the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. We've got the Computer Misuse Act in there twice. We've got the Freedom of Information Act and then GDPR or the Data Protection Act for the bottom one. So the GDPR is the European uh, legislation that replaces the Data Protection Act, but you can still get a mark for the Data Protection Act there as well. So that's the uh, November 2021 paper. The grey boundaries for that one are available on the OCR website, so you can have a look what you think you would have got. Um, but something around the 69 out of 80 mark would get us a grade 9 on that paper. This video shows you how you can get 80 out of 80 in hopefully the simplest way possible. Um, and this should be a useful video to help you out with your revision. If you do have any questions, then please post those into the comments section below or straight onto Google Classroom. Thank you very much for watching.